it's a it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome back to the Wilson Center Adid Dawisha. Um, he's a former public policy scholar and distinguished professor of political science at Miami University, Ohio. Um, he has lectured widely at academic institutions, think tanks, and governmental agencies in the US and around the world, um, including Britain, Germany, France, Italy, and many more countries, the Middle East, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and he is the number, uh, is the author of uh, uh, over 80 journal articles and book chapters, and he has published 11 books. And the latest, which is uh, this one, The Second Arab Awakening, was uh, finished at the Wilson Center. And, uh, I remember when Adit came to finish the book here, it was over a period of three months or five months. five months. So he came to me and said, Holly, I'm here to finish the book. You tell me what, you, what your demands are, and then I will fulfill them, and that's it, and then I will spend time finishing the book. So I thought about it. I said, OK, we want you to come and speak. We want you to take part in this conference. We want you to write a viewpoint for us. And I think before I continued, he said, fine, I'll do all these things. And that was it. So he was very disciplined. And the result is a wonderful book, good read, beautifully written. And I was just telling him in the office, for those of us who belong still to the generation of the first Arab awakening, it brought back a lot <coughs> of memories, you know, charismatic personality of Nasser, for example, the um, Nasser and Syria, I mean, Egypt and Syria, the yeah, the, the first Arab Republic, all these things, so you will be if you want to have a fun read and learn a lot, please make sure to pick up the book. Adit, you have the floor. Thank you. You have to live up to all these things I said. <laughs> well, as, I, as you say, I don't have anything uh, prepared, so I'm not going to read anything. But I just kind of thought the way to go about this is to uh, tell you something about uh, the book. In 20, uh, 25 minutes, I, I'm determined to finish by 12.30 so that we can have questions and answers here. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to say that uh, I am really very grateful, uh, truly. The microphone. Oh, she wanted to hold the microphone? Yeah. They are taping you. Is that better? Oh, oh, sorry. OK. I thought you wanted me to look like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> All I need to do is just take my jacket and sling it over my shoulder. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, so before I kind of start on this, I just want to say uh, that I'm really grateful to the Wilson Center, uh, to the Middle East program, uh, particularly to Halle, uh, who invited me to come for these uh, five months here. I can assure you that if I did not have these five months where I uh, dedicated myself fully to the writing, writing of, the, of the book, although I did write a pretty long paper on Iraq yes, <coughs> for you. <laughs> Um, I probably would still be working on this on this book, so I'm really grateful to the to the center and and for the work that it uh, that it does, inviting scholars to do uh, to do kind of some uh, scholarship here and, and 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 in a sense rid them from the administrative and teaching uh, <coughs> responsibilities. Um, I thought what I would do simply is to basically uh, go through the book uh, with with you to sort of give you an idea what the book is about. And then uh, 30, uh, for 25 minutes or so, and then and then we leave the half an hour for questions and uh, questions and answers. Um, and what I thought probably I I do is to uh, look at the titles that are involved in the books, the book, the title of the book, and the titles of each chapter. Uh, to in a sense they they kind of embed embed in them 
the uh, the kind of the essence of each uh, chapter that uh, that uh, that is involved. So the first thing that comes to mind, if you look at the book, and it's called the Second Arab Awakening, of course, is the word second. You know, uh, why why is is it uh, second? And Halle has already preempted me. Uh, <clears throat> it's a second Arab uh, awakening because there has been a first Arab awakening. There has been a first spate of revolutions. Uh, that uh, occurred in the 1950s and 1960s. I mean, we were all mesmerized. We were all seduced by the images that we saw on television and heard on the radio when these uh, revolutionary eruptions occurred uh, in uh, 2011. And, and, and the, uh, the abiding kind of response was, my God, finally, there is a revolution in the, in the Arab world. I mean, many of us, especially Middle Eastern specialists, had not, in a sense, in any way, uh, thought that this would happen. Uh, if somebody tells you, I knew about it, he or she is lying. Nobody, everybody was taken by surprise. Everybody thought that we're going to be continuing with the, usual, uh, with the usual state of affairs in the, Arab, in the Arab world. And so the revolutions came as a big surprise. Uh, and, and we were taken by this notion, revolution, finally, at last, as a revolution. Uh, that's kind of when I started thinking about this project, I thought, you know, people are forgetting that this is not the first revolution, that the Arab world had gone through a spate of revolutions in the 1950s and 1960s, which actually brought a lot of achievements, uh, socioeconomic achievements, the revolutions were aimed at uh, bridging the gap between rich and, uh, and poor, in many cases, uh, you know, GNP per capita was improved. Uh, certainly without any doubt, uh, the uh, lot of the poor improved uh, substantially as a result of these revolutions in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, education <coughs> became far more common and so on. But to my mind, the most abiding achievement of the first Arab revolutions, of the first Arab awakening, was the kind of sense of dignity and, uh, and, the, and the sense of worth that the Arab people had as a result of that, uh, when finally they were able to, in a sense, kick, kick out the yoke of colonialism and imperialism. Uh, for, for the first time, an, an Arab person can walk in the street and not see someone uh, who, in a sense, uh, walked beside him, but treated him as a second-class citizen because he happened to be an Englishman or a Frenchman or an Italian uh, and things. So to, to my mind, the the, the the most significant result of the first Arab awakening was this kind of sense of worth, was, was basically uh, the independence that uh, the Arab world uh, uh, got and the ability of the Arabs to kick out the imperialists and the colonialists, the British and the French, and so on and so forth, but for the first time to, to, to believe that they are equal to these mighty men whom they feared for centuries and, cent for centuries and even before that with the, with the, with the Turks and, and so on. So this was the kind of the abiding, uh, the, uh, the most important result, outcome of the first Arab uh, revolutions in the 1950s and the 1960s. And, and it, it is in many ways, they are more than apt to be called revolutions. But are they really, should they be called revolutions? Well, when I came to that uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, point, uh, I thought to myself, well, how do I define revolutions? And of course, if you go to the to the to a library shelves and look at uh, the word revolutions, it's I mean, revolutions is almost like an academic industry. There are miles of shelves on revolutions. But I was always struck, even when I was an undergraduate in the uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, I was always struck by the by the definition of revolutions that is offered by Hannah Arendt. Uh, to her, uh, in her book on revolutions, she argues she contrasts. The, the American Revolution with the French Revolution, and she says that the true revolution here is not the French Revolution, but the American, because the outcome of that revolution was democracy. Is that if, a revolution, if at the end of a, of a revolution you have freedom, then you are talking about a revolution. And that the French Revolution in, indeed produced anything but freedom uh, with the Jacobins and with the two Napoleonic empires and so on. And I thought, and I always kind of was struck by that, is that you know, regardless of other achievements, if the final achievement is not a democracy, then you have to be very careful about calling something 
a revolution. And what the actual uh, first Arab awakening, the first spate of revolutions did, was to actually produce the, I mean, all of these people who led the revolutions in the 50s and 60s and their inheritors were all young, visionary leaders uh, who were determined to improve the lot of people and so on and so forth. But almost all of them and their inheritors turned out to be the absolute uh, autocrats, some of them homicidal autocrats, against whom the second Arab uh, awakening uh, erupt, uh, erupted. And so that was the kind of the, the notion of freedom and democracy became the linchpin of the, uh, of the book. Uh, and it runs right through the entire, uh, the, every single page of the book. And what I did was to therefore look at the second Arab awakening from the revolutions that erupted in the late 2010, <clears throat> mainly in 2011 onward, and therefore see, uh, the, uh, at least check and analyze the progress of democracy in these uh, countries. And you can tell from the, from the titles of the chapters how I go about that. Uh, the first chapter is, well, not the first, but the chapter of this kind of the present, uh, of the present era, uh, the first one and the second kind of part of the book is called uh, uh, <clears throat> Hitting the, Ro the Democratic Road Running. Hitting the Democratic Road Running. But I do put a question mark at the end of that. And that's a chapter devoted to Egypt and, uh, Egypt and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And it works well because chronologically they were the first two revolutions uh, in, uh, that, uh, that erupted and that led to, the, uh, to other kind of revolutions, but also because they have gone furthest. They have traveled furthest on the road to democracy. Uh, they got rid of dictators without much loss of life, uh, without much suffering and pain and so on. Uh, they uh, then uh, had uh, free and fair elections uh, that uh, created constituent assemblies that were tasked with writing constitutions. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the constitution was indeed uh, written. In Tunisia, it's still being worked, uh, worked at, and supposedly at the end of the month, they're going to produce the, uh, the document. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, in Egypt, there was a presidential election uh, that, uh, again, was free and, uh, and, uh, and fair. Uh, the question mark there is because in both elections, as you well know, Islamist parties won. Uh, and, uh, and in, you know, many people continue to, ha to harbor some suspicion about the commitment of uh, Islamist uh, parties to, uh, to democracy. And I'll come to that later uh, because that, that's the topic of the, of the concluding chapter. Now, the chapter that follows it is, uh, is titled Potholes and in parentheses and some craters uh, on the road to democracy. And in that, as you probably will, will have guessed, I tackle the, uh, the, the progress of the revolutions in Libya, Yemen, and, uh, and Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain. Bahrain is where the crater is, because the Bahrainis uh, immediately, the king immediately throttled the, uh, the revolution uh, with the help, of course, of the, uh, of the Saudis. Uh, I mean, if you're looking for Jeffersonian democracy, Riyadh is not the place to go. Uh, to go. Uh, the Saudis were completely against any possibility of democratic change or whatever in that, uh, in that region. And the revolution died before it had almost uh, begun in Bahrain. In Libya and, uh, and in Yemen, the story is uh, different in the sense that both were able to get rid of their dictators. Uh, both uh, held, uh, held uh, elections uh, that were again free and, uh, free and fair. In Libya, there is a a constituent assembly that was uh, elected and is uh, supposedly at some point will start work on the constitution and, uh, and so on. So what's the problem? Where are the potholes on the road? It, in both cases, actually, there have been potholes. And if you look uh, along the, uh, the road, there, there will be many potholes to, uh, to come. The problem with Yemen and Libya is that they are tribal societies uh, d uh, divided by, uh, by very distinct regionalism. Uh, in Yemen, for example, the central government uh, has to think about uh, the, uh, you know, things like parliamentary, uh, parliamentary pro uh, pro uh, process, political parties, and so on, while fighting literally two civil wars, one in the north against the Houthi uh, Shiite uh, uh, tribes and region in the north, and one in the south uh, against an insurrection that is mounted mainly by, the, by Islamists. Uh, belonging to Al-Qaeda, or at least uh, share Al-Qaeda thinking, but also, also by others in the South who want secession from, uh, from uh, Yemen. And 
this kind of turmoil and chaos that the central government is uh, facing makes one think twice about, uh, about, about believing that somehow democratic progress is going to, uh, is going to uh, take hold in Yemen. In Libya, it's, very, uh, it's not just regionalism between the, the, the center of, between Benghazi and, and, uh, and Tripoli, but also in Libya, the, um, the inheritors of the revolution, those who actually in many ways uh, executed the revolution, were the groups, the militias, awash with, uh, with, uh, with weapons, who are now basically calling the tune in, the, in that country. Uh, the militias are much stronger than the fledgling Libyan army. Uh, and the authorities in, in, uh, in Tripoli, having been elected and all that sort of thing, have very little say over the, uh, the activities uh, of, the, of the various uh, militia. And as I don't know, you've been following the news, uh, they would even uh, basically go into the, into the National Assembly and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, threaten to, uh, threaten uh, to uh, all kind of things unless, uh, uh, unless uh, their demands are met. And to this very day, the central authority cannot impose its, uh, its will on the, on the country because these militias are all over the place and they are collectively much stronger than the, than the army. Again, uh, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't <clears throat> mean that there's not going to be democratic progress at the end, but certainly the potholes are very, very deep uh, and they line up this uh, road uh, for, the, for the foreseeable uh, future. Now, you may ask, why haven't I included Syria? I gave actually Syria a, a, a chapter all of its own because I think Syria is a very special case. Uh, Syria is, <clears throat> has been uh, a very important and pivotal Arab uh, country uh, and the tragic thing about Syria is that it now le lies in ruin uh, as a result of this very uh, ugly civil war that's happening in, uh, in Syria. The title of the chapter of, uh, on Syria is called Savages and Lions. <clears throat> the lion, of course, is a reference to the name of the ruling family, al-Assad, which in Arabic means, uh, means lion. Uh, and there's a nice interesting story how, uh, how the, the name of the Assads uh, kind of was changed over time from uh, uh, from uh, savages to, to lions. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time to go into that, but maybe you can get the book and, <laughs> and, and see this interesting, stor interesting stories. But what hap what's happened is that Assad the lion has returned to, uh, his, to his savage root, this guy who's an ophthalmologist who had studied in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Britain and is basically presiding, presiding over the devouring. Of his own of his own country. Yes, it's now the ugly. The ugliness is now the the uh, the, the mantra of both the the government forces and the opposition, without doubt. But had Assad been more uh, more considered, had Assad been willing to compromise early on, uh, then then we could have avoided uh, all the pain that now you see in uh, in Syria, and therefore I put all the blame. I mean, there's no way I put all the blame on Assad for whatever is happening uh, to Syria now, and I chronicle that and I uh, in in in, a, in, a, in great detail uh, in the uh, in the book. And what I try to be in the book, by the way, you see, as you see from the book, uh, it is actually not a large book. It's kind of very. Uh, it's, it's, it's very readable in the sense it's not very large. And, and that's, it's because I kind of tried to be as detailed as I could, but also to be concise. And when I say I was concise, I kind of focused on this argument alone, democracy. What is the outcome here? And how do we go about analyzing whatever is happening in each country in terms of democratic attainment? And what are the possibilities and so on? And so I tried to be very concise, not to kind of go on tangents and so on and so forth, but, but I think you will find that there is a lot of detail about the progress of these, uh, of these events and happenings in the... In the and then <clears throat> uh, I have a chapter actually uh, on... Uh, on um, uh, I think it, it's called... Um, uh, I forget, what is it called? Let me just see the last one. Because the last one is... is uh, yeah, it's there, it's there. No, the, the uh, oh, uh, tentative step on the democratic roads. Uh, and that's, I kind of looked at countries that did not actually go through revolutions. 
uh, Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq. But, they, but the revolutions themselves, in a sense, impacted uh, some of their policies. The revolutions became like a de what Samuel Huntington would call demonstration effects. Uh, and many of these leaders, uh, in a sense, indulged in political reform, uh, not because they wanted political reform, but basically to preempt uh, the kind of happenings that had occurred uh, else, uh, elsewhere. And again, in this chapter, I kind of go chronicle the, the developments in these, uh, in these countries with this particular focus on, uh, on democratic attainment. And then finally, the concluding chapter is called The Islamist Challenge. Now, why is that the concluding chapter? I go back to the, to the chapter on Egypt and, uh, and Syria. To my mind, if one looks for the last two and a half years, uh, what exactly has happened, you cannot escape the conclusion that the two countries that have, as I said, traveled furthest were the first two countries that actually uh, had revolution, that is Egypt and, uh, and, uh, and Tunisia. Uh, they're, they're far ahead of the other countries with all the potholes and the craters and, uh, and, uh, and so on. But, as I said earlier, and I said I was going to come back to that later, there is still a suspicion about democracy being achieved in these countries. Even though, if you look at the institutional developments, you think they're doing very well. Uh, they've done all of these things, they've had elections, uh, and so on and so forth. The problem here is that not many people believe that the Islamic, Islamist leaders who have won the elections are really committed to, uh, to democracy. Uh, to them, basically democracy, many, many will argue that democracy to them is a way to achieve power. Uh, but, not to kind of, uh, but not to indulge in and appreciate the demands and the conditions of democracies like you know, uh, the rights of individuals, the keeping the uh, uh, rights of minorities, particularly the rights of women, and so on and so forth. Um, and I actually uh, do go very deeply into those arguments uh, in, in both the cases of Egypt and Syria, uh, Egypt and Tunisia. And I conclude that while it is true that, uh, that uh, you know, there are certain, uh, certain kind of principles that these, two, that these Islamist parties adhere to, uh, that makes you, get, makes you worried or gives you some concern uh, about uh, the eventual, uh, eventual kind of, uh, event eventually democracy happening there, there are come some very interesting variations between the two. And I'm more, let's, not more, I am less uh, unhopeful about Tunisia than I am about Egypt. I think Egypt is problematic. But I think the way Tunisia is going, there is one case in all of that that should give us hope that <coughs> something uh, will come out of all this in terms of uh, democratic attainment. I think Tunisia is probably the best candidate. Uh, there are all kind of uh, signs in Egypt about the way the Islamists have behaved so far that uh, gives one pause uh, about, and that makes one worry about the eventuality of, uh, of true democratic uh, institutions being uh, established in, uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, and this comes in from, uh, from, their, from their thoughts, from their declarations, uh, from, the, uh, <clears throat> from, the, from the way that they have, in a sense, behaved, particularly in writing the Constitution and so on and so forth. Um, all of these things actually are missing in the Tunisian case. Uh, the Tunisians have been far more willing to compromise with the, with the secularists. Uh, the Tunisians have been, uh, have been upfront. I mean, the Tunisian Islamists, that's what I'm talking about. The Tunisian Islamists have been upfront in, uh, in, uh, in confirming that they will, uh, they, they, they will adhere to the liberal uh, laws vis-a-vis uh, -vis women that Tunisia, that Tunisia has, uh, and that uh, they, they have been kind of far more conciliatory uh, over issues that have arisen so far. And I think, finally, uh, <clears throat> the reason for that is that the Egyptian Islamists won a whopping majority in the, in the elections. Uh, the, uh, the Muslim brothers and the, and the Salafis between them got over 70% of the vote and over 70% of the uh, seats in the, uh, in the assembly. And when you have this kind of majority, you don't need to compromise. Why would you compromise when seven out of 10 Egyptians 
are behind you and behind your ideas and behind your ideology and behind your policies. And therefore, the will to compromise becomes very diminished, plus the fact that Egyptian society as a whole is much more conservative than Tunisian society. And therefore, the Islamists within that society tend to be far more conservative than the Tunisians. The Tunisians not only uh, are less conservative in their, uh, in their kind of Islamist outlook, actually they also, and that is, uh, to me, probably is, is a pivotal uh, reason, uh, they did not win a majority. They won a plurality. They won the most votes, but they could not call the tune on their own. Uh, the only way they could actually rule was through a coalition government with secularist uh, parties. And that, in a sense, even if, even if, had they had a kind of a more conservative agenda, that conservative agenda, unlike in Egypt, would not have been tolerated and would not have uh, occurred simply because uh, they uh, were partners in a much larger coalition uh, that uh, consisted of, uh, of, uh, of secularists. So basically, that's, that's the, that's the, uh, the book. Uh, now that I've told you all about it, you're thinking, well, why should I go get the book? He's now, I know all about it. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's the, I did it here, it's 12.30, as I promised, so uh, we can open it to yeah, questions. We open the floor to your uh, question. Yes, okay. please, just wait for the mic and uh, please identify yourself. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Is there a fundamental incompatibility between Islam and democracy and Sharia? That is, if you have secular law, if you have it at all, doesn't the Muslim Brotherhood or others or Islamists feel that Sharia dominates all and that's the problem? Well, um, that is true. I mean, if you are going to look at Sharia and go through it, uh, and if you look at the Quran, go through the sayings and so on. It is true that you can always, uh, you're always able to find things that in fact are not uh, compatible with, uh, with democracy. Uh, the point is like with every ideology, uh, it depends on the kind of uh, the, uh, the framework that you, that you begin with when you're trying to interpret uh, something. And that's why we actually have conservatives and liberals in, every, in any society. Uh, you both look at the same table uh, this, sorry, you look at the same uh, um, uh, text or the same or, or some kind of a survey opinion, and if you are uh, if you are a Republican, you'll interpret it very differently from if you are a, dem a Democrat. I think, to my mind, much of this is actually a matter of interpretation. How do you interpret a uh, a text? I mean, God knows if you look at the uh, at the at the New and Old Testament, uh, you can see you can, and if you are a conservative uh, nature, you can actually see a lot of stuff. Uh, that is not very conducive to liberal thoughts and liberal ideas, but you can also see other stuff that are very much within the liberal tradition. In other words, I think, to my mind, and I've been criticized for that for saying this, I think Islam is what Muslims make of it, uh, simply because people interpret things differently. And that is actually one of the main things that's happening between Tunisia and, uh, and, and Egypt is that many of the Egyptian Islamists are interpreting it in a very conservative, uh, almost rigid way, uh, whereas the Tunisians, you know, from Ghanoushi onward, uh, and whether it is because of political considerations, uh, because that's the only way they can survive, or whether because deep down they do have a, a, more, uh, a more kind of uh, liberal disposition, regardless whether, but they do actually interpret it in a, in a, in a very, in a less, uh, conservative uh, way, and they're willing for, uh, to, you know, uh, to uh, to compromise. I mean, you know, we look at, for example, at the notion of uh, the role of uh, the role of women. Uh, a number of uh, Muslim brothers' um, deputies, even women, actually, if you look at what they have been saying over the last over the last year, uh, you wouldn't think that these are women trying to defend women's rights. Uh, on the contrary, they, uh, it's the complete, uh, complete opposite. Whereas the men uh, of, uh, of Anahwa in, uh, in Tunisia have been far more accommodating to that. And as I say, it could be because Tunisian society uh, is less conservative, uh, the environment there, therefore is, uh, is, uh, is not as restrictive. I, I, I don't know the reasons, but generally speaking, 
I think that you can within Islam and uh, within, within looking at the Sharia, uh, you can be reasonably uh, liberal, to, uh, at least you can interpret it in a reasonably liberal way uh, that, would, that would allow you to coexist with, uh, with secular uh, forces. We shall see. I mean, we shall see. There's nothing, there's nothing in cement now. Uh, we shall see. But so far, uh, there is no way that you can look at the Tunisian and Egyptian case and say, oh, there's no difference between the two. You know, they're all Islamists and they all think the same way and they all behave the same way. Uh, Aman, uh, just wait for, uh, she's bringing the mic. Amal Mudalli, the Wilson Center. Uh, I did. I was looking at the title, and when I heard about uh, the revolutions in the 50s, I got a little bit alarmed because all of these revolutions, so-called revolutions, were uh, military coups. I mean, whether in Egypt or Syria or Iraq, they were. They were. The military took over, and I think the Arab world has been living now this hell because of that legacy of these uh, military uh, regimes. Uh, how can we call them revolutions and an awakening when, at that time, it was not a, ma a mass uh, revolution with the popular revolution, it was military coups. How can you call them awakening and revolution? Well, you're absolutely true in the sense that they were not popular uh, revolutions in the way that, for example, Iran had a, had a popular revo a revolution. No, it's, they're not. Um, uh, there are two things that I can, I can kind of answer this uh, question. First of all, is that in many cases, the military coups in, uh, in, in countries occurred after major uh, popular eruptions in those countries. I mean, I happened to be in Iraq at that time. I was very young, but I happened to be in Iraq. And the Iraqi revolution occurred in July 14 of 1958. Uh, and there is, and I know that from about April or May, there were demonstrations in the streets of, uh, of Baghdad and Basra and all these things, on a, literally on a daily, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, Egypt, there were huge demonstrations, mainly engineered by the Muslim Brothers, in the early part of 1952, which in a, in a, in a sense was the, was the precursor to the revolution, to the Nasserite revolution. So yes, it's not as though these, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, military coups, uh, or at least none of these revolutions occurred as a result of, directly of a popular uprising in the way these uh, Arab second uh, Arab awakening revolutions occurred, or indeed in the, as in the case of Iran, but I am convinced that the the, the military did not act uh, independent of or in contradiction to the uh, the feelings of the of the populace, which had already been in a sense um, uh, expressed in the in demonstrations beforehand. The second thing that I would answer is that. Regardless of how a particular change occurs, uh, and you're right, it was all military coups, uh, I w you, know, you would call something a revolution if, there's been a, if, if the result of that is a major, fundamental, radical, socioeconomic uh, changes. Look, the, Soviet, uh, <coughs> the, 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 the Russian Revolution is called Russian Revolution, but it basically, if you look at it, it was a coup. It was a, it's almost a military coup. But you call it a, a revolution because the end result is a complete and radical transformation of society, uh, of socioeconomic concerns, and so on. That's what happened in the, in the Arab world. The Arab world in the 1960s was very different from the Arab world in the, 19, in the 1940s. I mean, there have been such major changes, many of them absolutely radical uh, to society that occurred, that I, for one, would, uh, would, call, them, uh, would call them revolutions. Yes, Hello, my name is Ahmed. I'm an Egyptian judge. My question is about the behavior of Islamists in both... Egyptian judge? Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought you were a journalist. All right, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what my, are you doing here? <laughs> I, I'm Shouldn't Humphrey, you be judging? <laughs> I'm Humphrey Fellowship. I'm, I'm oh, okay. here on the professional course. All right. So my question is about the behavior of Islamists in both Tunisia and Egypt. Regarding Tunisia, after the assassination of the secularist opponent, Shukri Bilaid, yeah. the uh, Tunisian prime minister called for a national uh, government. However, the head of the Nahda party, Rashid Ghanoushi, rejected this idea. So why do you think that they have a compromising attitude? And this example showed that they have this majoritarian feeling. 
uh, in contrast, in Egypt, you said that, that they won a sweeping victory in the parliamentary elections. Yeah. However, in the presidential elections, Mohamed Morsi, the, who belongs to the Islamic current, won only with 1% margin, and he was running against... 52.48. It was more than 1%. 51 <laughs> and something. Yeah, yeah. anyway. 51.7, actually. Yeah. Can you get to the question? So, That's fine. Thank so you. he lost the sweeping victory, especially that he was running against the last prime minister under Mubarak. So why do we still think that they have a sweeping majority? Thank you. Okay. Well, if, as for the first, uh, the first question about uh, tu uh, Tunisia, you know, ma majoritarian uh, politics is not undemocratic. I mean, Britain is a majoritarian uh, government. Majoritarian, uh, maj majoritarian democracy means that you have a party that is in power, that has been elected uh, with a majority, but then you also have a strong opposition uh, uh, to it that, uh, that, in a sense, not only opposes, but prepares itself for the next kind of election that it might win, uh, win election. So majoritarianism should not be denigrated as something uh, less than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than democracy. Uh, what Anahva, I th my understanding of what Anahva was, uh, was uh, saying uh, was that the, actually the, the government uh, of the three uh, parties had been uh, working. I mean, look, w economically and so on, there are all kinds of problems and whatever, but it has been working as a, as a government. Uh, that the assassination of Bala Eid was, uh, I mean, was not, uh, it's not as though it was, it was uh, at least we don't have the evidence as to who did it. There's all kind of talk about uh, the League for the Protection of the Revolution or the Salafist and so on, but I don't know that uh, the government is implicated in it. The, uh, what, uh, what the opposition was saying uh, was that the, the, uh, uh, the government didn't seem to be particularly, uh, uh, particularly in a sense, st strong in its, in its attitudes towards these guys, the League uh, persons and the Salafists and, and, and so on. What happened was, was that you know, there was a, re, uh, a, 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 reformula a reformation of the, of the cabinet, a new prime minister, uh, and uh, certain uh, cabinet portfolios, including the foreign affairs, which was Ganoush's son-in-law, were, were, were kicked out and, and uh, new people uh, brought, uh, brought in. And I think that for a government in power, these kind of concessions are things to be, in, are, are things that I kind of, if you want to look at it from a positive point of view, I think it's, uh, it's more, than, more than enough. I mean, you don't have a government just because somebody gets assassinated, every government basically suddenly deciding that it will, it will uh, <coughs> you know, uh, dissolve itself and new national uh, governments to be, to be put. Let me tell you something about national governments. I actually hate national unity governments. I think that they, more often than not, they are uh, governments of national disunity. I come from Iraq and I've seen what national unity governments uh, do. They, they cause more harm than, uh, than good. And if the Tunisian has suddenly thought, oh well, now we're gonna bring every single uh, person into the, into the government, you're gonna get the same kind of paralysis that the Iraqi government uh, has, uh, has today. As for Egypt, Yes, you're right. I mean, the, the, uh, I was talking about uh, the, actually I was, folk, I was talking about the constitution writing. I mean, I didn't say that, but it's in the book. The, the stuff that I write about is the writing of the constitution and the way that the Islamists in Egypt basically uh, manipulated uh, the, uh, the whole process of the, of the writing uh, of the constitution to think mainly about the interest of the Islamists at the expense of the more general uh, and broader consensual uh, interest of Egyptian society. Uh, and my, my argument was, you know, I don't like that. I wish that uh, they, they didn't do that. I hope that next time round, uh, maybe there would be some kind of uh, modifications to the constitution and so on. But in the end, I understand it. I, I understand why it happened. When you, when you have 70% uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the constituent assembly behind you, the tendency to become conciliatory is much less. I mean, you need to be a saint. You really need to be a really good person to sort of say, I have 70%, but no, I'm gonna give the 30% more leeway than, than they should. I mean, that is a human, uh, uh, part of human nature. Now, Mercy's elections, finally, Mercy's election is interesting. 
Uh, and it is interesting to see, because as you know, there will be general elections. I don't know when, it still is in the, uh, in the whole thing, but let's say it's in, in, in the fall. If you, if you look at the parliamentary elections or the assembly elections and then look at the Mercy elections, then some people could say, hey, there is hope <laughs> that at least if the Islamists don't win out, uh, I mean, if, uh, if they don't win certainly with a big majority, at least they will win with such a small majority that will then force them, like the Tunisian Islamists, to be more conciliatory and more compromising. And that is, to me, is the, is the, is the best hope that people who actually worry about the way the, Islamist, Egypt, the Egyptian Islamists are going. That's one of the best kind of scenarios that can, uh, that can happen. Uh, Joshua Polchak from U.S. Department of State. Um, just a quick note, the ANC, you spoke of Saints ANC won 73% of the first post-apartheid election. And so, and I think, you know, it's, there are, there, I think there were hopes that the Brotherhood would lead the other types of examples that we have seen in post-transition. You mean the ANC in South Africa? Yeah. And I know that the, you know, Mandela is a, is a, yeah, is a 20th I mean, you get century. Mandela Saint, and a right? Gandhi or whatever once yeah. uh, every, you know, so let's not uh, and think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my question is wider and it ranges from, from Iran all the way to Morocco is, do you have any hope of a, a culture of citizenship developing such that instead of a relationship between the ruled and the rulers, you actually have an idea of citizenship, and I ask this because my office, particular office, focuses on, on women, and it seems like the, you know, the earlier revolutions you were talking about were all about men, about men standing up to the foreign men, yes. and this, these revolutions have ended up, um, even in, in Tunisia, uh, have ended up being mainly run by men, even though women were at the front lines, they were, they were standing shoulder to shoulder with men, across Libya, Tunisia, e Yemen. I mean, Yemen's an incredible example. And yet, in the transition, the people sitting in the smoky room making the constitution were, were men. So do you think this culture of citizenship is, is possible? Um, well, well can, can I just sort of say, and I, I don't like kind of apologizing for, uh, for Arab men, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the culture, I mean, masculine culture is, uh, is, is not uh, unique to the Arab world. Uh, it's, it is prevalent uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. Think about the Arab revolutions in the 1950s and 1960s. I mean, it's a man's revolution, but uh, I didn't know that the uh, women were particularly very politically active in the United States in the 1950s uh, or the 1960s, well, until the 1960s uh, and the revolutions, uh, that the cultural revolutions that, uh, <clears throat> that have occurred. Um, let's not forget that Tunisia has more women in its, uh, in its uh, parliament than we have women here in the American, uh, American uh, Congress. Uh, and so, I mean, it's, uh, it's very difficult for me to sort of say that somehow this is, uh, if, this, if this is true, that this is uh, somehow a, uh, uh, a kind of an identity issue that deals with, uh, with, the, Arab world, with the Arab world or the, or the Muslim, Muslim world. And the idea of citizenship, I mean, I think you have a point there. I agree with you. Um, the, the notion of citizenship uh, in these countries have been literally obliterated by years of, uh, of Procrustean authoritarianism. Uh, in the uh, in the in the area, so people don't have this same notion of rights that you are a citizen and therefore you have your your rights. They still think, what can I get out of government rather than what can I demand of uh, of government because it is it is my uh, my right. By the same token, I uh, I think uh, once this was we uh, with uh, we had a chat with David here. Uh, before I left, and his argument, and he was saying, not only do they not have a notion of right, but they, in many ways, they don't even have a notion of responsibility. Uh, they kind of, uh, it's, so that uh, it's, it is, it, without doubt, it's a major problem. Uh, when would they, in a sense, attain this? Uh, it's gonna be some time. Uh, because if you live for such a long time under an, a government that basically tells you, I will provide you with everything, whatever you need, you need to come to me, and I will then decide whether I'll give it to you or, uh, or not, and therefore you don't have any responsibility, just sit there, 
uh, and let us do the work. It's, uh, it's very difficult to actually change that kind of atti attitude away from that into, uh, into kind of a notion of uh, citizenship that sees both uh, a right, uh, that, that in a sense understands both that people have rights and have res uh, responsibilities. Uh, and that will come, I mean, hopefully, but it is a very difficult, difficult uh, cultural uh, transformation uh, that, we, that, 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 that happens and, and we really should not expect uh, uh, things to happen matter of, uh, matter of uh, days. I mean, you know, they've been living under, uh, under dictatorship and sometimes kind of real violent dictatorship for a long time. The mic is right behind. Hi, uh, my name is Roxy Reeves, and I'm one of your former students from many years ago. Hi, Roxy. Yes. Um, I have a rather broad question. I, when I think of the Middle East and the revolts, I can't not think about the United States. So I'm curious as to what your um, take is on how the revolts will impact U.S. foreign policy, and then how that thereby will impact the uh, Middle East at large, so to speak. Well, I mean, I think you, the U.S. policy is uh, schizophrenic on this, uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, and it's always been the case because we have to, in a sense, um, uh, balance our, 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 I, what, our ideology, what we believe in, our beliefs, with our interests. So when, they, when the two actually combine, uh, it's very easy and it's great. Uh, but when they don't, then there is a problem. For example, we are constantly hearing, uh, and particularly in the Middle East, in the Arab world, that America is hypocritical. And it is hypocritical, why? Because it, uh, can, it supports the likes of the Saudis uh, and people like that, uh, and certainly supported uh, Saddam for a long time. And you know, the, it's, this is a very common uh, uh, criticism uh, that uh, that uh, that you see in the in the in the Arab world, and if I were in a sense in the American administration, I would actually find it very difficult to uh, to do both. I mean, instinctively, deep down, like your knee-jerk reaction is to say, "Yippee!" You know, we are for for these revolutions because they're getting rid of dictators, and what's this is what we're all about. That's what America is all about. We are the fountain of, of uh, democratic knowledge. We are, the, in a sense, the base of democracy. So on. And, and in a sense, that's what you really want to do. Yeah, on the other hand, uh, you have strategic uh, interests. Uh, and for a long time, you know, we, we, we've been told over and over again uh, that these dictators were able to maintain uh, their hold on power for such a long time uh, because that's what they told the American, uh, ad various American administrations. You get rid of us, and guess what's going to happen? Uh, Iran is going to happen. Or the Islamists will, uh, will take over. Uh, or groups that are unfriendly to America will, uh, will take over. If I were Obama, uh, I mean, I would, be, I, I would have to think twice before going the whole hog uh, supporting, uh, supporting revolutionary forces. And actually what's happening in Syria is a salutary example. I, I can well understand why this administration uh, is reluctant about giving uh, more than just non-lethal uh, support to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the opposition uh, because you know, we've been bit before and uh, what happens if, the, if, the, if uh, Assad uh, collapses and what you see uh, is the rise of of Islamist uh, groups uh, that are basically, by all by all accounts, are are leading the the fight against uh, against Assad. I mean, I would be reluctant. To, I wish that that I I'm not saying that because I really am emotionally very committed uh, to the uh, to the opposition and to the overthrow uh, of these uh, of these horrible dictators. But I can well understand, again, I mean, I can well understand why you need to be careful about who you, uh, who you support. Uh, a, a, a lot of my friends in Iran, my friends, when we were in, in, in England, for example, uh, kind of blame Jimmy Carter for the fall of the Shah, rightly or wrongly. But they sort of say that Jimmy Carter's insistent that the Shah should liberalize and so on and so forth. 
uh, brought about the uh, Iranian revolution and good old America, see what, now, what you get now. Uh, so it's, it's a very complicated uh, picture and, and while emotionally you think, oh God, I wish they, they would kind of support, on the other hand, I will understand the complexity of the situation if you are the decision maker, the main decision maker, uh, trying to uh, kind of engineer uh, American foreign policy on, on, on issues like that. Yes, last question, please. Um, Kimberly Jenkins. Uh, the, oh, Kimberly Jenkins. Um, I'm uh, a Middle East analyst uh, for, for DHS. Um, Libya particularly seems very interesting to me and it seems to not get a lot of conversation and you touched on it um, when you were introducing your chapter of Libya. This habit they have um, of, and maybe it is a lack of understanding of citizenship, They've elected a government. They're very proud of it. I've heard Libyans argue that they're the most pro-American of the revolutions, and yet they can't seem to let their government govern. Um, you know, and I had read quite a bit about the uh, going into the the parliament, and you know, every time parliament makes a decision, those opposed simply try to overthrow it again. <laughs> and so I'm just curious on what your take is and what the path forward is going to be there. Well, Libya is interesting. Uh, was interesting to me is because um, you know after the uh, the Islamist uh, victories uh, in uh, in Egypt and Tunisia, uh, Libya was the uh, and Morocco by the way uh, when you know uh, the the, Isla the Islamist party actually won a plurality and and the king for the first time uh, made the Islamist leader a prime minister and so on. Uh, I mean, all the bets were on this happening in Libya, and Libya was the, one of the first uh, uh, countries that showed that this, no, was not necessarily the case, in the sense that the Islamist parties got hammered in the, uh, in the, Libyan, uh, in the Libyan revolution. Now, uh, in the, you know, the, the, the elections were, were it's a, it was a dual elections with par, uh, party lists and uh, individual constituency, and the individual constituency, uh, about 60, uh, are supposed to be part of the Islamist caucus and so on. So there is an Islamist presence, but by no means a majority in the uh, in the in the parliament. And that was actually interesting that the uh, you know secularists, uh, in fact, did pretty pretty well in uh, in Libya when everybody was saying you know there's going to be another Islamist uh, Islamist thing. But the problem with Libya is exactly what you said and what I had said earlier is the is that the the ones who executed the revolution, and the ones who believe uh, that had it not been for, for them, the revolution would not have occurred, that they, they were the ones who, uh, who uh, defeated the uh, Qaddafi's army, they were the ones who sacrificed, and so on. Uh, this, these uh, groups have far greater power in security, military issues than the, uh, than the, Libyan, uh, the Libyan army. Uh, and my feeling is on this, given that there was free and fair elections in, uh, in Libya, people flocked, they elected uh, their representative and so on and so forth, um, it's, is that if, if, if somehow this security problem is overcome, uh, then probably you would find Libya going back to a far more, in a sense, uh, on a far more reasonable path toward, uh, toward democracy than you see now. Uh, the government is actually working very hard to create an army. Uh, many of them are being sent to countries like Jordan and so on uh, to be trained and, uh, and come back. And, and again, it's not very clear. Uh, you can actually have an, ar uh, an, an army that is created with a, uh, with a Libyan national identity that does see itself separate from these, uh, uh, from these militias. But you can also see a Lebanese, uh, a Lebanese uh, example where you create a national army, and that's in the, 19, in the early 1980s, and you think that the army therefore is now going to uh, overcome all the uh, sectarian and regional divisions, and what happens is that uh, the army actually collapses and, and, and segments of it goes to its various sectarian, uh, sectarian uh, groups. It's so, I mean, I can't tell you, I, have no, I don't know what will happen in Libya, but Libya's salvation could, in a sense, be, depend on to what extent the new Libyan army is going to be a national army and an army that is equipped enough, if not to defeat the militias, at least to um, 
to preempt them, uh, to warn them against the kind of thing that you just uh, you just said uh, happened in in Libya. I mean, you know, it is still there to see. Uh, uh, I, we don't know, but a good. Uh, united, unifying national army will be, I think to my mind, at the moment, is the salvation of, uh, of, uh, of Libya. And whether that will happen or not, I don't know. Let's hope so. <laughs> I did. Uh, thank you uh, very much. It's the first time in months and months that we have had a meeting which was a bit upbeat. And usually we leave this meeting so depressed. So thank you very much and please join me. And you will sign the books for those of you who picked up the book.